Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you all to our conservation lecture series, where we bring out the best writers, scientists, and filmmakers to share their work with the public every month. And just to give you a heads up, uh, in March, we're going to have a double header for the public lecture series. On March 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the U.S. Peace Corps uh, with a roundtable and film. And then later on March 4th, also at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, the public lecture series is going to show another film called Return to Us, Restoring Alaska's Aklutna River about Pacific salmon restoration and indigenous local inhabitants that are helping make that happen. So if you're interested in future public lecture series, uh, please go to the NCTC website or the Friends of NCTC website since they're a sponsor of this series. Uh, and you can see all of the upcoming events there. Also, I'd like to just give a shout out to the Fish and Wildlife Service Conservation Library, which has a book club called Wild Read. And purely coincidentally, they're going to be reading Drew Lanham's book, uh, Home, which the Home Place, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So if you're interested in the public lecture series, check us out on the Friends of NCTC site or on the NCTC public lecture site. But now I'd like to give a very warm welcome uh, to our guest uh, this afternoon at NCTC, uh, Professor J. Drew Lanham. And let me tell you a little about him before I turn it over uh, to him. Uh, he's a native of Edgefield, South Carolina, and uh, Drew Lanham is the author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, which received the Reed Award from the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Southern Book Prize and was a finalist for the John Burroughs Medal. I can tell you this book um, is a beautiful elegy. It reminds me a lot actually of Aldo Leopold's uh, Sand County Almanac. Uh, one might almost feel like Leopold's looking over uh, Drew's shoulder as he uh, reads from this book. Uh, also, uh, Professor Lanham is a birder, a naturalist, a hunter conservationist, who's published essays and poetry and publications, including Orion, Audubon, Flycatcher, and Wilderness, and also in several anthologies, including The Colors of Nature, State of the Heart, Bartram's Living Legacy, and Carolina Writers at Home. He's an alumni and distinguished professor of wildlife ecology and a master teacher at Clemson University. And he and his family live in the upstate of South Carolina, a soaring hawk's downhill glide from the Southern Appalachian Escarpment that the Cherokee once called the Blue Wall. We're extremely excited to have him join us. Um, so please give a very warm virtual welcome uh, to Drew Lanham. Thanks, Drew, for coming out here. Thank you, Mark. for welcoming me half of, of wildness and wild things and conservation. And so today I would, I would like to share um, a little bit of, um, of, of how I write, how this, this convergence of, of science and art um, really has, has come to change not just my life, I think, but, but hopefully um, some of the path of, of conservation to think about. Certainly the National Conservation Training Center, it's a place that I credit with having um, a great deal of influence in, in my professional life and giving me permission to wander off the strict and straight path of an ornithologist and a scientist into the creative realm and the, the realm of imagination that really has us doing what we do in the first place. As I like to tell my students, conservation is not a field that we find to become rich, but certainly it is an endeavor of enrichment. And so I like to think about that as important. Um, for us to imagine. And so I would like to share with you a couple of pieces 
um, some recently written, others beyond that, that, um, that I've been working on for some time. And so I, I have two words that really have come to, to my mind in, in, rather recently, but I think they've always been a part of who it is that we are as professionals, and that is convergent urgency. So I would like for you to take those that that binomial, that phrase with you today, convergent urgency. I see convergent urgency as braided rivers that, that twist in and out of one another, surging towards their common goal of the sea. Salmon, humpbacked, hook jawed, and snaggle tooth, rushing in reverse of the waters wanting pull to natal pebbles and slacking pools to loose egg and melt in fatal spurts of a future that they will never see. The featherweight warbler at midnight flying across a full moon guided by stars and instinct, passing over abysmal gulf and land expanses that may or may not be to land in some random tree what tells it where to come down? Consider the thousand-pound bison, Tatanka, wandering because it feels a compulsion to graze blue stem and a pull that we can never know. There is something out there that brings life and force together. Much of it we can see, some we can explain by science. Volumes of it, though, are unknown to us. Cause and effect largely become guesses. The mysteries between known and unknown then feed our fascination. In our human terms, it is often a matter of who and when. History fills in from past facts and happenings. And so convergence, it's important. Urgency is certainly important as, as we are in a world that's warming up, as we're in a world where habitat is disappearing at alarming rates. We're in a world where species are in the vortices of extinction, sometimes and unrecoverably so. And so in thinking about this sort of path of of, of correction that we're on, this, this, this idea of moving forward. I want to share a, a wild story and a prayer. Yes, a prayer for those who care. Once upon a time, the first people of the First Nations saw first this land and the abundance that fed, that clothed, that housed, and that inspired them. It was a land overflowing with wildness, with mast and wild honey, farms cultivated in fertile valleys, communities hewn in canyon rocks, protein aplenty on the hoof in the ocean and spawning in the streams. And it was good, not perfect, because the first people were users too, but in a different way. And it was good. But then the sailing ships came and what had been plentifully imperfect began to dwindle and the good began to dwindle too. De Soto and the conquistadors began the plundering and the dwindling that would go unchecked even until now. The explorers like Catesby, Bartram, Lewis and Clark, they saw this abundance and were yet amazed even in its early waning and they wrote about it. They sometimes struggle for the words to describe the abundance, rivers choked with runs of eel and shad, skies darkened with flocks of birds that broke the branches out of mighty oaks, great grazing hordes that took days to pass a single point, prairie dog congregations counted in the millions. We'd call them more metropolis than towns. Condor soaring, ferret scurrying, forests dark and deep, steepled by monstrous skyscraping trees. 
marshes and prairies with no apparent end except the ocean or setting sun. The immigrant bird artist, a neurotic, bankrupt Scotsman wannabe poet named Alexander Wilson, and an arrogant, self-absorbed, biracial Franco-Haitian named John James Audubon painted the wonders of the waning, plentiful abundance, bird by bird. Through their eyes, the world began to see the natural wonders of this place, and it was good even as it was getting worse. There was still good for some. And so when one studies the evolution of our wild obsessing from the abundant plenty through manifest destiny, through decades of wanton waste to spiraling rates of extinction, to some reckoning eventually by Thoreau and Muir and George Bird Grinnell and the nameless bird loving women who contemplated their convictions for conservation, even, even as they demanded suffrage. And Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and George Washington Carver and Rosalie Edge and Aldo Leopold and Ding Darling, FDR, Sigurd Olson, Rachel Carson, E.O. Wilson, Jane Goodall, Majora Carter, Greta Thunberg, and those yet to be named, those yet to be born, that they have had a vision, that they have had some courage, a certain resolve to change things, the grit to do better, even in our worst of times to combat the market gunners and the punt boats, to stem the deadly tide of predatory plume hunters shooting long-legged waiters off of their nests by the millions for fashion's sake, bison exterminated by technology for greed and racist rationale, rail and repeating rifle took men west who slaughtered the herds by what was then high tech. All to push Lakota, Crow, Assiniboine, and Blackfoot out. Carcasses littering the ground with only the tongues removed and the remainder left to rot. The Great Plains fell silent, empty, no chickens dancing, no elk, no wolves, no pronghorn. The grizzlies gone. The Great Plains nations all in the way of westward expansion and our perceived some perceived progress, while back east and south, land worked by enslaved was given to freedmen, 40 acres and a mule, and then taken back and what was left was often stolen by tax lien and institutionalized trickery. And so those who often worked the soil and tried in vain to pay deed by sweat and toil, they failed. And so they too fell victim to broken promises that eventually became hunting plantations. And in the wake of privilege, Bob White, quail, covey rise, dogs running swamp deer and ducks on slave built rice marsh, it was and presently is a world built mostly for the pleasure of a few. And yet a broken black diaspora was dispossessed of connection to nature on lands they built. And the wild thing suffered all along, killed and plundered, until billions were reduced to fewer and fewer. And there were names for some because the once uncountable was suddenly down to one, Martha the passenger pigeon and Incas the Carolina parakeet, the last of their winged kind dying alone, languishing in Cincinnati zoo cages until life's last light dimmed to dark. Booming Ben, the heath hen, boomed his last on a Martha's Vineyard dune and met an inglorious end likely in the mouth of a feral cat. Now, where have we heard that fact? And a she-wolf's fierce green fire faded in a New Mexico draw because no one had their heart's ears ready to hear the mountain cry for its life. Swamps were drained and busted, soil eroded, the droughty dust bowl erupted. The black, rich Chernozum was plowed under to blow dust from Oklahoma and Kansas into the Capitol's doorstep. Old growth was cut and devastated. The great Lord God Bird himself double-wrapped knocked 
and Kent called in the den of ravenous saw and steam engine forestry that had run amok. And then an atom splits and collides. We are all newly threatened with oblivion. Poison and pesticides are sprayed everywhere carelessly for a better bug-free life, but it becomes death biomagnifying death. A courageous and quiet heroine named Rachel says, think, but feel more. And we try. Martin marches for equal rights, not just for black, but for all. There is no clean water to drink in Flint, toxic fumes choking the poor and people of color more. The Amazon burns. Plastic floats to make deadly new islands of Anthropocene trash. The world is warming up. Polar bears are drowning and poor children in Appalachia cannot breathe. Neither can George Floyd. History is past, isn't it? Well, not really. What we knew and saw before we see and live now. Now in this Anthropocene, in this present age of, of really an angst-ridden us, the questions that we faced as conservationists is as caretakers of something larger than our own human animal being and beyond the span of our conceited sapiens thinking as lovers of wildness and wild things and hopefully of one another there is now more than ever in our warmed earth life extincting predicament necessary convergence essential urgency these convergences coalesce around the most basic of questions, I think. One might even call these questions standards. And although the issues we face are daunting in their potential to dis disrupt life as we know it, and complex in cause and difficult in solving, I believe there are times that even the simplest of assumptions needs restating. And so I'd like for us to think of these these reassessments as an old path, one worn first by woods going habits of deer and foxes, of bears among mountain trails and otters along marsh margins. We can even imagine the invisible migratory paths of birds in the air as guiding us. Those ways we see and cannot are worn through generations so that others find the ways to wherever they need or want to go. By feel and faith wild things, they find their way. With each new birth hatching, coming and going, the asthmas are burned into instinct so that species become not just what they are, but who they are. And within the crucible of adaptation that nature exerts, they move through time. We are who and what we are because we followed our paths to our current place. Our paths have been worn into stone and sand and silt and clay and loam and ice and snow. Those paths have trod ground as free people and those bound in chains. Our plantigrade, five-toed, clumsy prints lie beside flat-footed, five-clawed bears wandering alone downstream and cloven-hooved deer arrowing single file to tender, sweet patches. We make trails and speed on superhighways. Our ways have been made good, but then worn bad. How we've treated each other with kindness or caring can be lauded, but far too often called into inhumane doubt. It falls within reason then, too, that our treatment of those non-human beings that we call wildlife, that that treatment has often been more cruel than kind. And so as any practitioner of a tradition, he, she, or they believe in, in returns to some sacrosanct text to revive intellect or instinct, our paths as conservationists require that we re-strike the trail now what questions must we revisit what are the basics that we have to retool again and it's pretty simple it's the who the what the when and the where it is the how of us it is the why of us it is our who our data feeds the lives that word by word build us in our kinship to the wild things we love 
again, that final question of when is easiest. It is now. Because contrary to what you've heard, extinction is a past tense verb that's future perfect. Imperfectly so. But conservation has to be more about doing something for what's past. To conserve is the root of us. It is our function. It is our genesis. It is our revival. I would argue that it has to become not our reactive work, but our proactive passion. And there is good that has gone on. I want us, as we think about what's happened in the past, to weave in the right that we've somehow found. The Morrill Act, the Lacey Act, Pelican Island, a hunter conservationist naturalist president, sitting lame duck but carving out swaths of national forest before a sleeping Congress could act. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Duck Stamp, Pittman Robertson, Dingle Johnson, the Endangered Species Act and CITES, the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts, the Farm Bill, the Paris Accord, <laughs> Executive Actions. A Sand County Almanac and Silent Spring and Biophilia, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Wildlife in America, the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, scrolls, and etchings on hides and rocks and stories in caves and around fire circles, passed down for ages. Holy words, sacred words, directives to care for our world and for one another. I, I have this imagination and I think about the ghosts of Rachel Carson and Dr. King talking environmental justice and land health over coffee, shade grown bird friendly coffee. So consider all of this, the good and the bad, what was, is, and might be. And I want us to think about what it took, then imagine harder at what it will take going forward. History, our current predicament, and the way ahead. Consider what we've changed from worse to better. Consider the context, the historical track. How did we save anything at all? If we think about it, it's really a miracle that there's anything left, but where are we now in this undulating sign function of discovery, exploitation, extinction, and hopefully recovery? What grade would you give us on this most recent test to inform, to inspire, to make good from bad, to make better worse, to conserve? Have we advanced or have we backslid? Are we just barely holding ground? I would ask you what, my fellow conservation colleagues, do we do in this convergent urgency? I think maybe a prayer for the wild things is in order. Wildness is the God I worship. The sins to answer for in, trans in transgression are intrusion and extinction. Evolution is the miraculous creation story. The difference between this adaptation and that mutation prime by time and selection derive the calculus of our beings in this moment, now. The primordial ooze slime molded Adam who spilled his seed as would homeward salmon swimming upriver from the sea. Lucy of the old of I gorge blossomed to Eve, plantigrated, fruiting to send wind blown fluff to the far reaches, finding fertile crescents on which to plant the peoples of this earth. I do not believe that she was a spare ribbed rip from him, but a being of her own womb conceived. Never less than she is Mother Gaia, nurturer goddess of us all. And on the seventh day, billions of years from the first, God still cannot take a break. The rock slung out with a bang from the dark to rest third from the modest dying star throbs and pulses under a cloud of human combusted funk. When our gills and fins give way to legged lungs with opposable thumbs, the end began. There have been many floods since the beginning and several arcs built on a promise of nevermore. 
I'm wondering, though, how all of those dinosaurs fit on board. The raven that never came back didn't return because it didn't want to get at like the witless white dove with the olive branch. My grandmother Mamatha sung, God sent Noah the rainbow sign, said it won't be water, but fire next time. That was the promise that her angry God made. Turns out that he may have been half right. The next one coming is already here, rising around our ankles and hip deep now, but was glacial ice just a little while back. The earth is on a slow burn, trying to drown itself back to cool. The mountains rose and are yet falling, ground down grain by grain from granite to pebbles to sand to silt. We are all the alluvium sliding back to sea. Ashes to the Atlantic for me. Ground like grain under pumice, we are dust in the wind. Cain slays Abel daily by chokehold and gerrymander. Polar bears are the one white thing suffering injustice, it seems, these days. Turns out that God likes it best when it was all connected in a single con congealed pangeic mass. Easier to walk from pole to pole without getting one's feet wet in a single great sea. Asking if extinction is forever why we are still here. And so, oh great wild that is in every weed beyond some intended spot. All wild things that fly with falcon speed and sing the thrushes hymns that hop and hover, that slither, that skulk and slide, that rise through clouds as mountain peak and sit low beneath black water as cypress swamp. Hear our pleas to be apart and not separate from you. That we in our knowing ape unknowing humble ourselves to care and to not be callous that we in our arrogance of control loosen death's grip on life to let go so that we might live, that we in all we are understand all that we are not. Let the wild things all sing, growl, chirp, call, bellow, or howl, and all say amen. So for me, <laughs> these... Um, these incantations, this writing, this convergence, this thinking about where we've been, thinking about where we are in our present state and where we hope to be in our future, the science is the critical scripture that, that guides us. But I think as we think, we have to feel. Conservation for me is defined as this intense this intense desire to save something for others that you don't even know, to save in abundance, to sacrifice for now so that a stranger might have something for later. Now, there are two four-letter words that encompass what conservation is. That's care and love. Care and love demand convergent urgency right now. And so I write to that convergent urgency. As an ornithologist, I, I spend a lot of time with my binoculars up trying to understand initially what the birds are, but then who they are. To see a single rose-breasted grosbeak in my quarantined backyard and not being able to follow that bird latitudinally in its spring ascent northward and its return in the south means that I get, I get to intensify my relationship with those birds to come to understand, again, the miracle of migration, that my yard can serve as a patchwork piece in this greater quilt. And I think that's ultimately that that's who we are. We are quilters. We are practitioners of passion. And so I do so or I attempt to do so by writing. The data that I know best most days is myself and then perhaps the birds beyond that. And so I would hope that we don't lose that passion. I hope that in this new day, there is room again for our heads to connect to our hearts 
And then in that transcendence from head to heart and the connecting, we are able to reach our hands forward and to work in a different way. And so it's why I write for birds. It's why I write for wildness. It's, it's why I do the work that I do. And I think about all of these days that I've spent in Shepherdstown, West Virginia at the National Conservation Training Center in the presence of not just our past, but in the prospects for our future. And so in, in, in being that place, I marvel over all of the, the greatness around me, those people who, who saw nature as a part of themselves and saw themselves as a part of it and, and worked in all of these different ways to gather the data that ultimately would not just inform us, but that would inspire us. And I think that that's what we miss so often. That as hard as we work as scientists in remote field locations under extreme conditions with less than adequate funding frequently, that gathering the data that objectively doing the science of, of analyzing the research, publishing the results of our peer review, of disseminating that information to our peers, that we cannot, it let, we cannot let that message rest in the choir of us, that it has to spread outward from us to the general public, and that those that we have not touched and talked to before now demand our attention. They demand our time. They demand our toil. And so I would, I would like to think that as much as I've done as a scientist, that there is an opportunity for me to translate the data of, 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 of neotropical migratory bird movement and white-tailed deer moving across landscapes, that there is an opportunity for me to think in ways that are more broadly scoped. I have a mantra, same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. Same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. I'm not the first one to think that, obviously, but I think for us to come to some place of empathy, after all, empathy is simply a soul's convergence having the feelings, sharing those feelings with someone or something else. Well, how can I do that? Well, we share the same range maps as all of the wild things that we love. We too have habitat requirements and foraging requirements. We too deal with who and where we can love those that we desire to love. We want to feel safe. We want to be able to migrate unimpeded. And so in sharing these range maps, in this convergent way of thinking, in this urgent way of thinking about conservation, whether your work is words or whether it is far flung afield, the time is now for us to come together on this. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be at such a special place, even remotely. I always tell folks that the National Conservation Training Center, in my opinion, is some of the best tax money that was ever spent in the conservation world, at least as far as you can spend it on bricks and mortar. It's a temple of sorts. And it's a way for us to converge. It's a place for us to come together before we disperse into the hinterlands, into 
the wild and beyond and to the close and nearby to help people not only understand what wilderness is, but to understand that wild is the weed growing in a place that it shouldn't. So I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, past my remarks. I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm looking forward to your comments. And I'm looking forward to that time beyond this now as we match ask as we stay socially distant, as we listen to the experts and the science, and as we care for one another, to be able to gather again in a flock of kindred spirits, not just in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, but all points here between and beyond that. So thank you so much to Mark Madison for this opportunity for this time. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to speak on behalf of a place that I love dearly and a mission that that makes my heart beat. So thank you all for your time and your attention. Well, thank you, Drew. That was wonderful. <laughs> that is the number one uh, comment we're getting is how inspirational it was as we sit in the, uh, at least here in the middle of winter and the, the skies are cloudy and, <clears throat> and snowy. Um, this was a breath of sunshine. I have to say, as the historian of the Fish and Wildlife Service, I loved um, the historical trajectory uh, from our, our luminaries and, and even including Martha the Pigeon. It's wonderful. I don't know if you know, but um, this is our 150th anniversary <laughs> as an agency. So it's a good time uh, to do like you did, to look back and to plan forward. And I think uh, one of the questions that's come about uh, recently, uh, during your talk, was from uh, Ann and Brittany, and, and they asked, "How can national parks and national wildlife refuges encourage and provide more inclusive spaces for dialogue and enjoyment, especially for people of color?" And I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, Mark, I do. You know, I spend a lot of time in the Ace Basin, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and there. Out of, it's one of the 50 great places, at least as National Geographic says. I think it certainly is. Um, and I spend a lot of time down there birding. I hunt down there some. But what I often see as I'm traveling there and going over, um, going over various uh, rivers and, and over the creeks, and, and I think about the history that's there. I think about going... Um, across the Cumbie River, and I think about Harriet Tubman's raid. <laughs> Every time I cross the Cumbie and, and turn, um, turn east into Nemours um, Wildlife Foundation there, I think about Harriet Tubman's ability to cross landscapes, to make these, these movements across these landscapes, and what a heroic figure she is, but also what... Um, what a naturalist that she had to be. And I think about that water flowing and I think about connecting people, not just with the wildness, but the woman <laughs> and, and that we need to understand um, the role of human beings in the landscape. So I can look out across all of that rice marsh that's so rich with black ducks. There are black rails there. There are black neck stilts. There are red winged blackbirds, but that was, that was built by black hands. And so we, we need to tell those stories. We need to tell the truth. And this cultural and, and, and conservation convergence then can bring in more people. You know, I cross those creeks and I frequently see pe people fishing. And as a birder, there is no, there is no put and take bird with my binoculars. Um, there's no catch and release. But people on those creeks are fishing with the intent of releasing those flounder into hot grease. And so thinking about how people are sustaining themselves on the landscape um, and expanding our conversations to ones not just of, of, of watching, not just of recreation, but also of sustenance. And so as the, the Hollings and the Ace Basin National Wildlife Refuge, as it, as it touches all of these places, as it touches the rivers that Harriet uh, Tubman traversed, as it touches these rice marshes 
where sweat, blood, tears, and bones lie in that pluff mud. Bring those stories up. Help people understand that it's not just about four-legged, furred, and finned beings, but also about human beings. Then I think we begin to broaden the scope and people see us in a, in a different light. A related question, Drew. One of the things that comes across in the home place is um, uh, in your improbable journey to become a wildlife ecologist. Um, and it, it resonates with us in Fish and Wildlife Service, too. Um, I think our fields have struggled to be as inclusive as we might like them to be. And I wonder if from your own biography or your experience teaching, um, you have some ideas about how we might um, become more representative of the, the U.S. as a whole. Well, one of the things, Mark, I got a, a question on a, um, from a student, actually, yesterday. I was, I was doing a talk in Corvallis, um, and he asked me what I thought the pivotal point was for me to become who I am. And of course, I have to give credit to parents who are scientists and, and growing up rurally and, and all of that. And, and part of that is, is personal privilege, right, that, that I have to recognize. But then what made the difference for me was a second grade teacher named Mrs. Beasley, as she passed out those mimeograph sheets of birds. And I can remember that, that my first mockingbird and me taking my pencil and shading as opposed to my crayons like my desk mate did. Um, I suppose maybe she thought it was a painted bunning or something. It was a northern mockingbird. And Mrs. Beasley paid attention to that. And she didn't restrict me. She didn't ask me why I didn't have more imagination about the bird. She recognized that here was a child who had a passion for something. Because I would go to the library and I checked out in the little kids in the second grader section, um, every book that I could find about birds. And then a librarian by the name of Mrs. Wingo, yes, Mrs. Wingo, opened up the other part of the library for me to go and find more books. So I say that to say that freedom, that allowing children to expand into those places um, is important and helping them exercise their passion. That's for anything I tell people for all of those years that I was an engineering major, I was doing okay. I would have graduated in engineering had I continued on that miserable path. But who wants a dispassioned engineer designing aircraft engines? So to turn your passion. So I think one of the ways to become more inclusive is we hear that cliche of meeting people where they are. That's important. But that not only is sort of a, a story in how we traverse across land or space, but where we meet in, in here, um, in heart space. So understanding from whence we come and understanding that, that the connections, for example, to climate change, most of us had our first exposure is to see polar bears not being able to haul out on ice flows because of, of melting seas and sea level rise. But that that same air, remember the mantra, same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate, that that same air is the air that is impacting little black, brown, and red children at it orders of magnitude greater from a, in terms of, of lung capacity and breathing. It's the same air that's impacting those bears. So again, we've got to expand the message. I always tell undergrads, wildlife, I mean, it's everything from, from rocket science, right, to getting your hands in the soil and everything in between. But the most difficult critter that you will ever manage or study is the one that you see in the mirror. And so we, we have to open the doors wider. And, and by opening those doors wider, it's widening, broadening the scope. I tell people that I call myself a bird watcher as much as I call myself a birder because bird watching implies that anybody can do it, right? That you need to be appreciative of the pigeon that's flying through the concrete canyon as much as the peregrine that's perched 
on some remote cliff. And so understanding that nature is everywhere to be seen and had and impacting us means that we began to pull in people from urban centers. It means we began to pull in people who did not grow up as I grew up. It means that we began to expand who we are. And by expanding who we are, our definition of us, others then see themselves in who we are. I, uh, I liked in your, in your book, The Home Place, how you mentioned the overdue fines for 50 birds of town and city. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of our most popular publications ever. <laughs> and uh, we actually have the original artwork in our archives. So it, 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 it struck close to home. And uh, Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you know. I, yeah, I, you kept that from mi millions of other birders who. <laughs> it, it was, I, and I would take it back, finally pay the fine, and then I would recheck it. <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that hit close to home. We have another question uh, here from Barbara, and she wants to know, Drew, how do you keep your spirit nourished uh, in a time of so much damage? and assault on natural places. Can you repeat and say that again, Mark? You... Yeah, she wanted to know how you keep your spirit nourished uh, in, in, after witnessing so much damage and assault on natural places. Well, it's, um, you know, part of it is, again, I have to go back to my root, having grown up with it, right? Um, and, and I'm going to insert a part of a, a, another question in here to answer this. And you'll note the title colored man's love affair with nature. Yep. Um, and I know that's triggering to some people, but the reason part of the reason that I use that is because of all that I am. Um, I want people to see me and know who I am and respect my color, my blackness, but I also want them to understand that it's so much more than what you see on the outside. Um, it's the, that red miry clay of the Piedmont. It's the sandy shoals of Chevy's Creek. It's tobacco drying um, in, in summer's last breath. It's the cloudy white of cotton. It's the, the blue dankness of that, of that slave hold in that middle passage. And so that's all me. And so when I see nature being assaulted, I take it personally. Because every last one of those colors is being erased. Someone is trying to erase that. And so to take it personally, I think, um, means to care. And it's part of the reason I think that sometimes, you know, people see science as sterile. Because they'll read a scientific paper, they'll read that report, and it just seems like someone went out, gathered data, reported it, published it, and then went on to the next thing. They don't understand that that person who is reporting, um, who has studied um, wood frogs for 20 years and is the expert, got their first inkling of a life doing this because they, they fell in love with tadpoles in a mud puddle. And so I, I keep going by going back to that root. I keep going by going back to that not a, a, a Crayola box of 64, but more crayons and colors than I can count that make me up. And so by doing that, it, it inspires me to, to want to do more. Um, I mean, and, and, and sometimes that's, that's a word that's written. Um, it's, it's thinking about how humanity connects not just to nature, but to one another. And that if we're treating one another um, with disdain, we can't love nature. And if we're treating nature with disdain, we can't love one another. So I don't see those things as separate from one another. So in that, in that way, um, in, in, in all of us being colored by our experiences, all of us being colored by obviously our genome, but that we try to find some commonality in the same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. And that in doing that, and that in understanding and undertaking this mission to be a conservationist, and it's not a job, it's not a career, it's a mission. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Stegner said at some point, <laughs> conservation is, is exactly like you said. It's not a job. It's a, it's a passion of some sort. Well, related to the, your answer here, we had a, a question from Ellen Murphy, who, uh, who writes, the book is fantastic. Uh, and it seems like your family offered you the opportunity to connect with nature. How can I, as a white person, help kids of color who might not have that support? and help them connect to nature. Again, I, you know, I go back to, to Mrs. Beasley and, um, and, and her giving me space. And I, I'll tell you one of the ways that, um, that I've seen it, it done is, for example, and, I, and I'll use, um, I, I, you know, it's no better example than, to, than names, right? And I think about Ken and Kimberly Kaufman and the work that they do and uh, in Ohio and working with communities in Toledo, but all across Ohio, that they have opened their arms, that they have really made an effort. This is an intentional effort to, 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 put your, to open your arms and say, here we are, um, come and enjoy birds with us. You don't have to have a life list of, of a thousand birds or a hundred birds or even know what a bird is. Um, but we welcome you here to this place um, to to enjoy it, to 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 learn about nature. So again, I think it's sometimes it's sitting back and listening um, to to those stories. You know, it's uh, it, it's and and we have this frequent concert, uh, conservation conversation about inclusion and diversity and who's out there in the outdoors. There are lots of, of, of BIPOC, lots of, of Black, Indigenous, and people of color out there in nature. Um, it's not always in the ways that we have defined. So, for example, when I, one short example, I think, about, I think about seeing near the shack, Aldo Leopold Shack in Baraboo, I think about seeing someone alongside the road gathering garlic mustard. And they weren't gathering it, though, as an invasive exotic. And we have to watch our words. Mm -hmm. They weren't gathering it as a non-native. This was someone gathering it as food. So, so, so we have to think about context of nature. We have to think about these stories. We have to think about everybody's story. Another mantra of mine is everybody has a bird story. Sometimes it's about the leg of chicken that you had last night. And so in listening to that bird story, we then become informed as to who people are, what their lives are. And we can meet them, hopefully, in some common place that helps us understand why nature is important to all of us. I have to ask this question because your talk was so infused with history and your book talked about grappling um, with parts of, of history uh, that are less pleasant at your alma mater, buildings yeah. named after John C. Calhoun or Pitchfork Ben Tillman. We have some skeletons in the closet for the conservation movement too. And, and I wonder how do we um, laud the achievements of conservation uh, while still looking clearly at the past and not glossing over things? Yeah, that's a that's an important question, Mark. And I'll t <laughs> tell you, just put putting the final touches on a on a on a lengthy piece about John James Audubon um, this morning that I just sent off. And so, uh, you know, it, it's first of all um, those those bones. Um, you you we we have to see them. We exhume them. And the thing about um, the the thing about these past figures now. Um, and this is a little morose, but if you think about it, you exhume them. Guess what? You see through those skeletons. <laughs> so there should not be any blind spots. We can see what's behind those bare bones. Um, we know those bare bones um, now, many of us for, for who they were. Um, it's like I tell people about my, my baby elephant um, folio or my Audubon <laughs> reprints. I'm not going to take them off my wall and burn them. But I look at them and know who that person was and know that that he would have believed me to be um, less than him because of my skin color and that um, he would have certainly valued me less than any bird 
that he shot, killed, or painted. And so in understanding that, I can say, you know what? I know, I know John James Audubon's field marks. We know John Muir's field marks. We know um, Louis Agassiz Fuerte's field marks. We know some of these field marks. And so understanding who some of these people were, understanding that helps me put them in context. And being able to put them in context, I can look and say, wow, yeah, amazing, amazing um, life-like portrayal of yellow-breasted chat, but don't be that person. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, d- d- do, not be, do not be that person. I mean, memories are monuments. And, and, and so I think when we misremember people in perfect light, um, then we do ourselves and, and others no favor. So one of the things that I do is, as with self, I try to be open-handed with my students about history. And as much as we know about the past, saying who people were. And in doing that, the students then, because we're talking about ethics all the time, if we're looking for the perfect person, then we're not going to have any lessons to learn. So we have to be better than John James Audubon or better than Muir or better than Aldo or better than, than, than anyone before us. But if there were lessons offered that we can learn from that are not just negative, but that are also positive, then we try to take those forward. So that's, that's the stance that, that I take. Um, I tell people if a monument um, doesn't, doesn't come down, what I want is it fully informed. I want it surrounded with an, an unignorable story. I want the story to be as high as the sword that's raised so that when I see the swords that's ra- the sword that's raised in some lost cause, I see the full story behind that person. And then I go forward in an informed light. That's perfect. All right. One last question, Drew. Have to ask you, I know you're a professor. I know you wrote eloquently about inspiring your students. You're speaking to a a very large audience of conservationists. What's your charge to us, to to us federal conservationists and partners and, and supporters watching this? You know, um, every, every day that you rise and breathe, that you take that deep belly breath in and you understand that you've got another day at it, go for it with, with, with this understanding that it's an enriching process and that, that it's an incalculable wealth that you gain by being able to do this. And then when you hit the bed that night, tired from walking a field or writing the words, you take another one of those deep belly breaths because guess what? We can't take breathing for granted either because of a virus that would take it from us or those that might murder us in the streets and take it from us. But if you have breath at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, if you've worked towards making this world better by loving wildness and wild things in your fellow human being, close your eyes and rest well. Then do it again the next day. Those seem like perfect words to go out on. Drew, thank you so much for your thoughtful and inspirational talk. I think we all enjoyed that. I also want to thank those of you who took the time to tune in. Uh, Give us an hour of your day to uh, be provoked and maybe get a new perspective. And uh, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye.